Hi, my name is Janae, and I wanted to share a story about how my family and I have personally been affected by 9-11. My uncle, Leon Smith Jr., was a fire lieutenant uh, for Ladder 118 in Brooklyn, New York, and his truck was one of the first trucks to respond for the first tower that had gone down. A little backstory, um, Leon Smith has been a firefighter for 20 plus years, and uh, he's known this dream ever since he was eight years old. He knew that he wanted to help people, and that was just how he would serve. Even on his days off, he would help, you know, he would go into the community, um, help local businesses, anyone that he just felt were in need, that's just what he did. So it's not surprising that that day on September 11th, 2001, that, um, you know, he was placed in that truck for a reason. Um, he was going to do something that he loved to do. And um, before he was, um, you know, going over to respond. He had talked with my aunt and their last conversation, you know, he just told her that he loved her. Um, they have three beautiful girls who are actually just getting ready to start college. And, you know, one of her encouraging words was, um, you know, you're a hero and you're a hero to us. You're a hero to our family. And, um, you know, it was just, she says, it's just a beautiful, somber moment, and she knew that that could potentially be the last moment that she would hear from him. And he said, you know, I love you, I'm gonna call you, and um, those were his last words. Uh, everyone in his company uh, perished that day, and it's just a time to reflect on how important just family and people and loved ones are to us around us. Can we now pause for 30 seconds and just take this time to remember all of those who have been lost? we pause for a moment of silence? Father, we thank you that we're alive. And we have a world here that needs Jesus. We thank you for the lives that have come before us that have sacrificed for us and built a foundation for us to stand on, to continue the work. Lord, we thank you for this, this day. In this country, this day reminds us that every day is precious and that we have much work to do. We pray it in the name of Jesus. And every soul said, amen, amen. Thank you for coming tonight. My name's Dean. I want to welcome some guests tonight. Will you give my guests a hand? Come on up. And my brother, David. And uh, one more round of applause, would you please? So, uh, before we get... I thought tonight would be a perfect night since it is September 11th and what September 11th uh, began, as you know, was a, was a lot of turmoil. I don't know if it began the turmoil, but accentuated and got more American involvement in, in particularly in Afghanistan. And just in the last few weeks, that whole... Uh, culture has collapsed 
and a government has collapsed. But Jesus has been working in that, and uh, th these three each have a story to tell about that country. Now, here's the thing. We're going to record this tonight, and we're going, when we record it, we're going to uh, mute out their names and, and, and block out their faces because we want to protect them because they may want to, they do want to go back to this and work with their friends. And if, if people know that they're talking about the, uh, that they're talking about the underground church, then everybody who was associated with them uh, is, is going to be murdered. And they're already in grave danger. So we don't want you to record this tonight, video or whatever. If you, if you, ha if you just must take a picture, then we just block out their faces. But I, I really prefer you, you not. So uh, before I talk to these new friends, and you work with an organization that we partnered with, and uh, so I want to hear your story because they've been working on the ground in Afghanistan. My brother David is the CEO of Open Doors USA, and you work in these troubled areas. Before we hear the specifics of their underground churches, give us a picture, the broad picture of Afghanistan, the numbers, the the picture of what Jesus is doing there. Sure. When we do research around the world, all the different countries where there may be persecution, where people may face oppression, harassment, even the threat or very real possibility of murder. Afghanistan ranks right underneath North Korea. And now, obviously, this year, it might be number one by the time we finish our, our research. And that tells you something because it is just an exceptionally difficult place. The Taliban for many years has ruled parts of the, of the country. It, to be a Christian means to be part of an underground church. It doesn't mean that you come to a big gathering like this, certainly. Uh, and it has been a very difficult area. But I like to remind people that God has a great love for Afghanistan. And one person, two people, folks like this, can make a tremendous difference. Even all the way back to the 50s, there was a man named J. Christie Wilson who began, he just had a passion for Afghanistan. And at that time, it was ruled by a king, a king Shah. And he went in and began, he was given permission because of some high-level conversations to start one foreign church there, just for Americans, just for expat, expats in Kabul. And that church existed for a few years. Uh, they actually built a building, the only church that they had in Kabul at that time. And it lasted about three years when they, when they began to hear murmurs about Afghans because everywhere Jesus is preached, now here, this doesn't matter if it's North Korea, Afghanistan. Everywhere the name of Jesus is lifted up, it does amazing things. Even in Afghanistan, even right now in the midst of this. And I was talking to our folks in Afghanistan uh, just uh, yesterday. And I can tell you, amazing things are happening even in the turmoil. But three years after this church was built by J. Christie Wilson, the, the government began to hear murmurs of, what is this underground church? And so they determined to tear it down, and they did. On July, I think it was July 17th of 1973, the last physical thing that we would identify as a church was torn down, and, and Jay Christie had said to the, to the king, to the mayor of Kabul and those people, if you tear this church down, this government will fall. And that night, on July 17th, the king was overthrown, the very night they tore it down. And it's interesting that when they began to tear that building down, they, they dug underneath the foundation because they had heard about an underground church. They thought it maybe was underneath the church. But guess what? They did not dig up the underground church. And it still exists today with these folks. With what we're doing. So God is good in Afghanistan, oh. even in hard times. Now, the two of you uh, have had jobs in Kabul. And I, I, maybe we won't say what you've been doing, because if that gets out of part of the conversation, then they could trace you back. But you've had jobs, but your real assignment in Afghanistan was the church, yes? Yes. Was, uh... Are you on there? Yep, yes. Uh, 
our mission was to uh, meet the souls, share the gospel. Yeah. And just so the, these folks have been coming to church, they show up on a Sunday, they, they have a worship team. To, they may have a hard time picturing what, a, what does it look like to be part of an illegal church? Do people, you, you can't announce that it's happening. There's no uh, commercials. There's no advertising. How do people find out about this gathering that you're, these gatherings that you host? Yes, uh, we have uh, two uh, underground churches that we've been serving. Uh, be able to come into that underground church, we screen and screen and screen. Uh, they cannot be able to come into this underground church unless you are well um, validated. And uh, uh, they have to go through, even though they confess with their lips that the, uh, Jesus is the, their Savior, and we, they go through a phases of a Bible study, and then when, when they, that is done, when, I, when the teachers are approved, then they can come to underground church. Because underground church, we share the lives. Life of me, life of you, life of all those uh, 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 members of church. So uh, we share our life together in that underground church. And you meet in homes? Yes, homes. Does it rotate every week? Is it a different place? It's, uh, for us, it was the same, same place. Same. Uh -huh. um, the worship, we have, uh, he is a worship leader. Even, you know, the missionary, now we, not, we cannot you know, preach the gospel in the public. So we have to do something for there. So I am uh, teaching uh, Korean language at, and I teach uh, trumpet because I'm playing, playing trumpet. So we connect with that kind of thing and then we met with you know, people, students like that, and we, and we preach the gospel like this, personally. Beautiful. And do you, you speak the language? What language? We the, speak the Korean. Lang, the, the, the Afghan language. Yes. We're getting better and better. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And there are they, they're passionate. They love to learn English as well. Yes. And that's, yes. Uh, we teach English. I teach English. And those, uh, those students who are learning lang English language in my house, they are the prospects of my Bible study students, right. and there, there's a great uh, uh, right. results for them, from that. Now, David, the, you and I have had private conversations that the, the Taliban, they know a lot of people that are teachers. Well, whenever you have people who are salt and light in, in these areas, the Taliban certainly suspects that Jesus is doing things, right? And then, of course, they don't like education, so I'm sure that's one of the issues that, that uh, every teacher in the country faces. And there are Jesus people, I can confirm, you know, all over in industry and doing things in that country, uh, right. sub subversively in a sense, or covertly is maybe a better word. There's about somewhere around 10,000 Jesus followers there. And in our experience, they don't often meet in groups larger than 10 or 15, often two, three, four. I don't know what your experience is, but um, it, it, it's, a, it's a strong and sturdy church, but a small church. I think, I think Americans, when they meet a Muslim, there are, there are, there's a large mosque with about 5,000 people three minutes from here, okay? And it's uh, led by an Egyptian man, but it's, I think, primarily a Pakistani uh, and, uh, and some Egyptians. But uh, when they meet a Muslim, they don't even know where to start. How, to sh how do we share Jesus? How, wh where do you begin when you're talking to an Afghan citizen and, they, and they're, they don't know anything about Jesus other than what, no. what their holy book would no. tell them? Most Muslim, Muslim knows about Jesus Christ. Because they know about him? In the Quran, they say about Jesus. But Jesus, they, they believe Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. Only Jesus is a, a prophet. A prophet. Yeah. Right. So Jesus is the best prophet, the highest prophet, and Muhammad is the last prophet. So you begin, because they have a, a, a 
worldview that says Jesus is the highest prophet. You begin at that. You begin talking with them about that. We, uh, first of all, when we meet, uh, we approach them and we report, first report. We just talk about the common things. And once they are uh, uh, familiar with this, when they talk with us for about 10 minutes or so, we become very close. That's the, most, uh, the cultural, culture of Muslims. And we, we go into whatever that uh, from, goes from there on. Muslims, uh, they love Christians. They respect us a lot. Uh, and uh, about uh, gospel, we just ask them, do you believe Jesus? And, and go f- from there. I, the, the friends I know in Iran, in uh, Pakistan, David and I have a mutual friend. I met him through David. He works in Pakistan. The stories they tell are that in these countries, like Afghanistan, G- Jesus is a, people are having visions of Jesus. Jesus is appearing to them in the middle of, of, of their daily prayer times. Uh, there's an Iranian brother who worships here, and he found Jesus not because somebody evangelized him. He, he was praying his, toward Mecca, and Jesus appeared to him. I mean, it's just miraculous. Are you hearing those, are experiencing those kinds of supernatural encounters in Afghanistan? I myself uh, do not, but the souls that I meet, my students that I meet in my, in my house and the universities, they uh, meet Jesus in their vision, in their, in their dream. It happens a lot more than in America, I think. Why do, why do you think that is? Why, why are these things happening in the Muslim world in a way they're not happening? I personally think in America, is, gospel is spoken through so many channels here. But in that land, the gospel has not, is not spoken in anywhere. Only through our mouth, only through the teachers, only through uh, only uh, specific channels. Uh, God loves Afghanistan. And he wants to show himself. He wants them to come to, come to know Jesus. So he appears in their dreams, their vision. He wants the nation of Afghanistan to know him, come and worship him as the king of kings. Did you know, did you have a sense that this, the government was about to fall? Was there, was there a sense that the Taliban was coming in strong again? Did, what, tell us about that. From a political point of view, what was the vibe on the street? Uh, we did not expect Taliban to come this quickly. We, we knew Taliban are coming through the news, but and with, the, with our prayers, we were so shocked how fast the Taliban came. And that's why we came with the evacuation flights. Uh, we didn't expect. So we planned to leave the land with the word of God that uh, gave us a confirmation, Jeremiah chapter 10, uh, 17, 18, 19 verse. That was a specific uh, word of God that uh, God has given to us to leave the land. It was, it was very difficult moments, but because God has commanded us to leave, so we decided to leave. But even though we were in the middle of uh, leaving, getting ready to leave, Taliban's, they came so quickly to the, to the yeah. capital, uh, a couple. And you, you were in grave danger. I mean, there was a, you were on one of the last flights out, I believe you told me that somebody put a gun to your head. We tried to uh, get into the airport, the Kabul International Airport, but there is uh, five different gates. So we tried uh, out uh, pick just one uh, gate. Right. And at that time, we didn't have any information. We don't have any information. So we just uh, pick any, you know, one of our fives. So we get into that gate, but there was a mistake. There was in Taliban, you know. The yeah. Taliban was yeah. in charge so, of that. Yeah, right. Okay. So, but we have to go into the anyway, the Taliban or not, whatever. 
So my wife and other mission, the woman missionary, to try pass that uh, Taliban. But Taliban saw me. It looks like me is local people, and he holding and you know he beat me. He beat my arms, and also he got you know the gun. He aimed to my point my forehead. Yeah. So, but I have to go. I have to pass them. Because too late already in the past, so I don't want to meet. I don't want to miss that too late. The ladies, so I try to get and pass that them. But I don't know how can you pass that the yeah, that Taliban. But I passed. Hallelujah! Or, Taliban did not trigger the gun. Yeah, you you feel you feel like it was a miracle that he even got past. That's a miracle that Taliban did not trigger the yeah. gun. On uh, yeah. forehead, uh, forehead of my husband. Yeah, I, yeah, and past that Taliban, but there's another Taliban you know, there. So at that time, I want to try show uh, show my our passport, American passport, and I give to that Taliban uh, and Taliban holding. I thought uh, maybe he checked and the passport, you know, uh, check me, and then you know they, he wants pass you know that gate, but. When he holding that my passport, he get get thrown somewhere. So no holding, we will we'll go back. Okay, don't do that. And we, we'll, I pack you know the passport and then, uh, keep up you know at that time to, into the airport. That was a miracle that the Taliban did not throw away the passport. That was yeah. the lifeline for for my husband. Yeah, I'll say. Um, these are young people. When, when you're in Afghanistan, I think this is true. It's certainly true of India. And I understand Iran is even younger. But these are young. It's a young country. You know, it's not like there's a bunch of uh, senior citizens walking around. These are, these are people in their 20s, a lot of them. Even the Taliban. They look older, they look but... Old. Yeah. Uh, talk yes. about that. Yes, they look old, old. But they are early 20s. Yeah. Most, most of them are early 20s, and uh, yes. So like. I, just, I just say that because it's, there's a lot of impetuousness and, and youthful stupidity in, in the Taliban, yeah. and um, you probably need to know they're stupid. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> You're like, oh, thanks, Dean. Um, uh, but I guess... When I was there in Kabul, uh, you know, I was at that airport, and it was dangerous then, and it was stable. But I had a sense, and this is like on a spiritual level, that this is an oppressed, like, demonic. There's a lot of demonic things happening there. Did you have that feeling? And if so, explain it to these yeah. friends. When we try to um, uh, escape uh, Afgan Afghanistan, the first day we tried that, you know, that happened. We, by moving by car, we stay in the car, but when we get out the car, the feeling is totally different. The bed, you know, the pressure is, you know, so different in the car and outside the car. Because so you control the spirit yeah. in that car. Bumping like this. Yeah. Does that resonate with you? Yes, uh, inside the car and outside the car is totally different. The spirit of a spirit in that land, Afghanistan, is totally different than America. Very heavy of spiritual uh, darkness, heaviness. Unless you pray, you will be swamped by this darkness spirit. So we we constantly uh, pray and constantly be aligned with God. Otherwise. Uh, you, you just cannot win. Uh, there's so many battles that we have to go through, and you just lose if you're not aligned with God. So totally, the atmosphere of the spirit there is so dark, and it just swamped you. You mentioned that the Lord had given you a scripture in Jeremiah chapter 10. What, what verses? Verse 17, 18, 19. 17, 18, 19. I'm going to read this to you. And when, when we were talking the other day, I went home and read this uh, to my family and shared it with David. Let me read these verses. And then Dave, when I, 
respond to this, would you? And, and, and give us some insight from what your team on the ground is saying. Verse 17. Pack your bags and prepare to leave. The siege is about to begin. For this is what the Lord says. Suddenly I will fling out all of you who live in this land. I will pour great troubles upon you. And at last you will feel my anger. That's 17, 18. And you said 19 also? My wound is severe. And my grief is great. My sickness is incurable. But I must bear it. Well, when I hear that, I think about all the mysterious ways in which God meets people. And the reality is open doors, we exist to be in the country. or We never try to airlift people out, but we obviously know that sometimes part of God's plan in a very sick area is that people escape. Because as, as they escape, what you will find is there are Jesus people at all these exits around this country. And I, my personal feeling, my hope, my prayer is that the grace in all of this is that as people are, are in this pressure cooker of evil and then they begin to flee, they're walking into a future with Jesus. They're right. interacting with Jesus right. people, medical people, and trauma care people, and teachers and you know right. they're, they're going across the border into Uzbekistan where there are Jesus people there and Tajikistan where there are Jesus people and even into Iran where are Jesus people and Pakistan so I think sometimes it's not what we would want and that's not how we would plan but God's plan is that in the midst of evil he tells you get up and go and there there along yeah. on your exit is is an answer to your prayer does that resonate with the two of you Yes, uh, we've been praying. Uh, the, our NGO uh, group advised us to leave right away, but we list, We don't list. Yes, we listen to them, but we need to. We were waiting for God's word directly. Right. Um, God's word is priority than anybody else. So on that, uh, F, uh, so when we got when we received this word of God. Uh, we uh, decided before before getting this verse. We we decided to stay. Uh, we will stay with our our people. We will stay with uh, you know Christian. We will fight with uh, uh, local Christians. We will stay there with you know uh, uh, sharing their life together. But with this verse, uh, God has given us the specifically pack your bag and leave. Uh, without word, we. Uh, uh, decided to leave, and which, is, uh, is, which was very, very difficult. Um, having, uh, having brothers and sisters uh, sharing their life together, leaving was, uh, making that decision was yeah. very difficult. Uh, here's one thing I want to teach, and, and I'd, I'd be interested for you to, to diagnose the American church, because it's, it's interesting to hear about the Afghan church, but we're, we're Jesus people in Tacoma, Washington, and we want to win our city for Christ. And, uh, but but when, when I'm around David and I hear the stories of the persecuted church around the world, when you and I sat down, I say to myself, in your context, prayer isn't a luxury. It's a necessity. It's a must. And in our context, it's kind of like, Maybe we'll pray. Maybe we won't pray. It's we treat it like a luxury, like 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 it's a meditation, like it's a yoga class or something, and and not like it's life or death for you. You got to hear from God. It's a, it's a, yeah. It's a lifeline. Prayer is lifeline for uh, all the believers in Afghanistan, and we experience so many times that the lifeline, prayer is a lifeline, especially in the middle of uh, uh, evacuation from Afghanistan, there's a tens and tens of thousands of people in the middle of evacuation. And we cannot move back, we cannot move forward, we cannot go anywhere. There's a six of us trying to escape. And if I lose my husband, I'm holding on to his backpack like lifeline. And six of us, we, we just hold on to each other so, so, 
uh, tightly because we cannot lose them. In that moment, we have to walk all the way. We don't know how long it's going to be, but we have to get to that point to get into the airport. At that moment, we felt the power of intercessory prayers. We prayed, we prayed, and we felt the heaviness of, of how so many people are praying for us. We felt that. Thousands of people are there, and we cannot move, we cannot budge, but our line was open. God was opening the path, little by little. Only our path was open. It is a miracle yeah. how yeah. God was opening the thousands of people packed together, and our path was yeah. open, open. For one God, and a God. half hours, we, 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 we walked little by little, one and a half hours, nonstop, got to the uh, uh, destination. Yeah, when I was arriving here and I testimony my church, and I talking about this kind of thing, and after finishing the testimony, one of uh, friends come to me. I pray like that. Lord, open that path, just like Moses' miracle like wow. that. He was praying that for you. Yeah. Wow, 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 love it. Yes. Prayers were on a, powerful on a, prayers. On a practical note, by the way, that prayer led them crawling through a sewer. So hey, when you pray, be ready. <laughs> because, you know, uh, you, you just got to be, you got to be willing to do everything in your power. And then let God do everything in his power. Somebody say amen. Amen. So let's, let's close this way. I'm going to start with you. David will end with you. Uh, give me two minutes to this American church that wants to win their family. They want to win their city for Jesus. We're, this isn't a religious exercise. We, we want to see God move. We want to, uh, that's why we're doing all this. Um, talk to them. Yes, God is alive. You need to pray. We prayed and we pray he listened. And he actually talks to us. He says, I am with you. We experienced that in evacuation of, of Af Afghanistan. We heard that so many times. Daughter, I am with you. Do not be afraid. I will help you. I will bless you. I will love you. I will lead you. And that's exactly what he did. Pray, pray works. God is alive. Almighty God will help you. Only just pray, your, your prayer will be answered with Almighty God power. God. Amen. Thank you. Do you guys believe in a sensory prayer? Do you believe that? Yeah. That power? Yes. When I uh, tried to uh, escape the Afghanistan three days uh, of three night, four days. During the, that day, I have uh, that uh, power. I have I've got the, the powers. So I believe that intercessory prayer is really important. God works with the intercessory prayer, okay? Afghanistan, there's nobody can help them at this time, but when you pray, God works with that intercessory prayer. So please, please pray for Afghanistan, and God works. Thank you. Yeah, I would just add, add to that by saying I the reason why I mentioned that church in 1973 is sometimes I think we give up too soon this is a generational battle God still has a plan for Afghanistan he's not done this is a hard season days months even years to come but Jesus wants to be in relationship with Afghanis and we need to pray and never give up on what God is doing there because this is a generational fight. It might be 50 years, 100 years. We just got to keep praying and pressing in uh, for what's happening there and in North Korea and all these places that seem totally intractable in, in its problem. And I suppose in a sense, that speaks to where we're at. If I was, I was say something to the American church, like, hey, you have 10 years of, of, of struggle, don't give up. Let's keep pressing in. It, it's a generational fight. I want to share one thing. Uh, I, we serve an underground church. Name is a Rock Church. Do you know how many uh, 
we had baptized in this year? 40. Can you believe that? How many baptized in this church? 40. 40. And these are 40 people that uh, if, if people found out they had become Jesus people, they'd be dead. Yeah, Don't. right. Yeah. It's just very great. Months ago, I think months ago, we had one uh, guy we had baptized. And that guy, when he come to our church, he bring holding a gun. A gun? Yeah. And tell me, please don't take a photo. And don't recording, you know, these kind yeah, of things. Yeah, don't record and, it. And you baptized him with a gun on did you? <laughs> America, you know. <laughs> hey, can we give a thunderous thank you to our guests here? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God.